Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Let's see how we do this evening. Um, I think I went live a little too soon, didn't do my thumbnail uh, or my monetization, but you know what? Heck with it. So this evening, I'm going to discuss the um, inverse Kramer fund that was pointed out to me by a member of the audience and also the long Kramer fund. And uh, let's just see how those are doing because they're only about a month old, but that's what we're going to go over this evening. And then I'm going to Kind of let the audience guide things from there. So first, what we'll do um, is we will look up, uh, we'll look them up first. So the inverse Kramer tracker ETF. So I find this uh, hilarious. I'm so glad that someone came up with this because those of us who follow Mr. Kramer for any amount of time at all uh, know some of the more ludicrous things that that man has said. So. Um, what I did here, I just pulled up uh, the S Gem, which to me sounds like Slim Gem, the Inverse Kramer Tracker ETF. Uh, so the Inverse Kramer Tracker ETF seeks to provide investments result investment results that are approximately the opposite of, before fees and expenses, the results of the investments recommended by a television personality, Jim Kramer, which again I find hilarious. Now the fun has kind of uh, flatlined here recently i mean it went up in march it's only been around like a month or a month and a half or so but you can kind of see that it basically um has dropped since then here so kind of uh take that in here let me get some things set up on the back end here and again we'll see how we do in terms of live viewers uh the more that we get the longer i'll keep going and i'll kind of let the audience guide the discussion here so but yeah, just offhand, like I can think of many, many insane things that Mr. Kramer has said. And some people think he does it on purpose. Some people think that uh, he just, you know, may, may be genuine with what he's saying. But the one that sticks out the most is perhaps the, the one when he said in 08 to buy Bear Stearns when Bear Stearns went bankrupt. Um, and he's actually, you know, he's, he's literally on record saying buy Bear Stearns. So that one, and then, like he said, the bull market was over last year. Uh, that was another another one. I could get the buzzer sound, and I'd probably be playing it the whole video. But um, the man has had numerous uh, mis, mis predictions. So now I don't know if these pay a dividend, but I, I did intend to do a video on these at least. So I'm cashing in on that. I promise now. Here we go here. I'm just uh, fixing my thumbnail here. Uh, let me. Okay. Do they pay dividends? Got multiple tabs open here. So got one of you live. Let me go to Yahoo, Yahoo Finance, and we'll see. Let's see here. Finance, finance, finance. Uh, oh, <laughs> I don't have the tab up. Here we go. So I'm just gonna go here. Finance, Yahoo Finance. Got a full cup of coffee for the live stream tonight. So let's see here. Uh, we'll start with uh, S. Jim. S. Jim. Come on, Yahoo. Oh, here we go. It's called Northern Lights Fund Trust. So I think Northern Lights is actually the company that that does this. Um. Hmm. You know what I should do? I sh I need to I need to throw in some I need to throw in some dividend funds that I'm gonna compare. So I'll probably um, how do I want to do this? I'll probably add in SVOL. Yeah, we'll just compare to SVOL. That's a fan favorite. So SVOL here at the bottom. That's paying an eighteen percent uh, yield. So let me do this here. See, we're going from like two to three at a time. So more content, more bang for your buck. Not really buck, because who's really spending money unless you super chat me? <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so yeah, none of these pay dividends. So I'm going to throw in, towards the end of this, I'm going to throw in, uh, I'll throw a bone 
to the dividend crowd and we'll discuss um, SVOL. But that'll be towards the end of the video. For now, let's just kind of uh, read them and weep in terms of the uh, Jim Cramer fund uh, performances. So, all right. I've got my thumbnail. Yeah, I just, I kicked off the live stream a little, little sooner than I uh, anticipated. So, um, but yeah. Yeah, Jim Cramer, what other, some of you watching, uh, comment in the comment section here, what other ludicrous predictions have you made? Oh, I remember, I think January 2022, when inflation first really started kicking in and the Fed started raising interest rates, he said that um, Netflix was going to recover like lightning fast, and then it just completely tanked. So, yeah, that, that happened. That was a real thing. Okay. But, yeah, I think, um, you know, Bear Stearns, certainly that probably has to rank up there at the top of the list in terms of just completely wrong predictions that he's made. I mean, he, he's had a lot of them and we'll pull up some articles here in just a minute uh, to go over that. Cause he's had, Oh, wait a minute. You know, my thumbnail is going to be a little misleading here. It's comparing Jim Cramer ETFs to SVOL just to be clear. So, yeah, let me, um, yeah, we're comparing, it, every time I see it, it looks like Slim Jim, S Jim to L Jim to the SVOL. Oh, that's going to be too long. Darn it. Oh, well, just trying to get something here. here anybody has any comments I will get to them very soon okay got our title now so I'll be in the comments just in a second here MacBooks running a little hot here I'm not sure why okay so back to the stream here. Uh, I've got two of you, no comments yet. And we have Kathy Wood's face at the bottom of the screen. So, all right, back to Slim Jim here, S. Jim. This one debuted March 2nd at 2493. It peaked March 17th, St. Patty's Day at 2626. Dropped down to um, 2482. And then it's dropped further to um, 2458, which is where it's at right now. And in the after hours, it's actually down another 4%. So, and I don't think these are going to pay dividends. But, so let's see, for those keeping track at home, we now have, we have the, uh, here's the SARK, the uh, Kathy Wood inverse fund. We have the inverse Tesla or TSLQ. We have one called Cruise, K-R-U-Z, which is Unusual Whales, Subversive, oh, I got to look this one up, Subversive, Republican, something. What is this? Unusual Whales, Subversive, Republican Trading ETF. That title sounds very intriguing. Don't know what it is, but just saw it here. Let me look it up. Let's see. Oh, there's one for, I guess it's political. There's one for Democrat, too. That's funny. Subversive. Let's see what, uh, th God, there's, you know how they used to say there's an app for everything? Pretty soon they're going to be saying there's an ETF for everything. So there's one called NANC and Cruz, K-R-U-Z. I don't know if that's after, like, the senator. Senator from Texas. So, uh, okay, let me, I might, I might pull this up on the screen share here. Let's see how we're doing. Uh, yeah, Slim Jim is what we're talking about right now. Um, but I just moved on to another one that caught my eye because there's like a peer group of all of these inverse uh, ETFs. 
So this one, the unusual Wales subversive Republican trading ETF, KRUZ. Let me switch over uh, to another screen here because I pulled up something. Uh, I pulled up some more info. This might be from the site directly uh, about there's two of them. There's a NANC and a KRUZ. Unusual Wales ETFs. Unusual Wales is a, an affordable options and equity data platform that has been at the forefront of the intersection of politics and finance for over three years. They have started a re, reinvigorated effort on how lobbying, committee conflicts, and finance ch changes Congress. You know what they need? They need an ETF that just mimics all of Pelosi's trades. They are excited to be working on bringing new financial products so that retail can invest alongside Congress and reduce information asymmetries. So this, these uh, two funds are onto something here. They, they've got the right idea, I think. I like a lot of that, reduce information asymmetries. I'll have to look at the performance of these. If you wanna see the philosophy behind following members of Congress, so this is almost exactly what, like what I just said. I mentioned one in particular. Uh, but if you want to see the philosophy behind following members of Congress trades and portfolios, please see reports on how Congress trades. Here are two ETF unusual whales. Here are two ETF unusual whales is supporting that sentence doesn't make sense as a data provider. Unusual whales subversive Democrat subversive Democratic trading ETF and unusual whale subversive Republican trading ETF, KRUZ. And the other one is ticker symbol NANC. I got to look these up now. I'm very intrigued now. So NANC and KRUZ, I just want to see how these have performed. Because if you can cash in on some of the, you know, mimicking what people in Congress do, uh, you're way ahead of the game. That's something that I've always thought would be a really good thing to do. So let's see here. Okay, so NANC, starting out with this one first, we'll go after the Democrat one first. Uh, this is 25.23 a share. It's down in the after hours to 24.30. It's been around since um, oh February 7th, which happens to be someone's birthday. Import very important day. Uh, it's been, this has been about flat, but like from start from beginning to end. But within this range here, you can see we bottomed out March 13th at 23.06. Uh, the peak was around when the fund first started. And look at that, we're almost at the same 25.32 here, but 25.23 today. So this one's been relatively flat. Now this KRUZ one, let's look how this one's done. And hey, at this point, I don't care, you know, what, whichever one, uh, whichever side of the aisle is doing better. Like I would invest in the one that provides the better rate of return. But I really like this concept. I didn't even know this was around. And this wasn't even what the video was supposed to be about. But let's see here. Okay, so this one also debuted, debuted on February 7th, and I didn't even hear about this. And none of you in the comments mentioned this either. We just, I just happened to stumble on this today. So um, how interesting. 2438, it's down to 2360 in the after hours. Bottomed out at, let's see, let's see here, 2293. And second bottom was here, 2303. Uh, and then... 52 week range, which is more like probably 10 week range since it debuted, was basically 2293 to 2541. Don't see any information about dividends, but I will look for sure. So let's see historical prices, dividends, apply that filter. Uh, okay, no dividend info. Let's see how we're doing on viewership here. Um, okay, back to the stream yard. Okay, we got four of you, only one comment so far. So bring some comments, bring them on. So, okay, yeah, so we detoured a bit here from the Kramer funds. We covered, uh, oh, I just realized you're echoing the joke I made. Yeah, Slim Jim, that's what it reminds me of every time I see it. Isn't that what's like on the package of the Slim Jim? They should have his face with a clown nose. I meant to do that thumbnail. I actually did one in a video last year but um just didn't do it today started the live stream a little bit too soon so i kept my same lazy thumbnail eventually i'll spice up the thumbnails a little bit more but like i said i'm still trying to hit my watch hours i think i've got i may still have seven or eight hundred to go at this point so i really need every video from here on to uh really do well this one may not we'll see how it does but because i added in um 
SVOL, which I'm going to talk about at the end, that may help it. So yeah, I agree. Yeesh. <laughs> right. Uh, but getting there, getting there for sure. I think I have till May 1st or maybe May 4th. Can't remember exactly how they count it. So, okay. That's the unusual whales. We'll continue to keep a really close eye on that for sure. Cause I like the concept behind that. And I think I have this tab open twice. So, oh, maybe not. Let me actually, let me close this. Oh, I did have it open twice. Okay, now the L gem, the L gem is the long Kramer fund. This is one I wouldn't touch because I pretty much would do the opposite of what he says. I wouldn't, I, I can't think of anything offhand that he's recommended that has actually done what he said. It usually does the opposite. But this one has also been around since March 2nd. And I tell you, this could be, 2023 could be the year for ETFs because we're having ETFs coming out like for everything, which is incredible. So, okay, 2493, we got up to 2573, March 6th, we dropped to 2355. So the 52 week range, which in this case is more like the maybe six or seven week range, uh, is 2348, the low point, and 2590, the high point. And we're at 2502 right now. And interestingly, no um, after hours information. So those are the two uh, Jim Cramer funds. I uh, haven't really seen any dividend information, but we'll definitely keep a very, very close eye on these four because, um, you know, between trading on what Jim Cramer says and trading on what, what Congress does, those could be some very lucrative opportunities. Like, I mean, if you're shorting what Jim Cramer says and you're following what people in Congress do, you can get to be a multimillionaire fast. So, or maybe even take the hard way, run for Congress, get in and get all the inside tips. That's something I actually wouldn't mind doing. So, okay, so we covered those. Now let's go to SVOL. This is the dividend bone I'm throwing in for the day here. So let's see, we're still at about 1783, 17.83% uh, dividend yield. which I just round up to 18%. Interestingly, we're not showing anything in terms of how it did Friday uh, or after hours, but we're still at 2212. So still relatively cheap, hasn't fluctuated that much. In about a month, it's gone up maybe 22 cents. And it looks like it's been on a steadily, st steadily inching up a few cents here and there. Uh, we're actually, I think we're, we're slightly, oh, we're slightly up. We're up about 24 cents from the start of the year. We had gotten up to 2290, but the good thing about this fund, it seems to stay within a fairly tight range. If we go back a year, it was a little higher, maybe like a dollar higher. So we've been getting a really good dividend on SVOL, but we haven't been fluctuating too much. Now, in a minute here, after I kind of look at the actual monthly dividend payouts, and I can't recall if we've gotten one for this month yet or not, but uh, let me see. Oh, March 27th was our last one. So we're, we're going to be getting one in the next few days here for April. It's remaining at 32 cents. So this one is a pretty stable um, dividend payout. Some of you would disagree because some of you think these are all, you know, volatility plays. Expense ratio is 0.66%, uh, which is lower than some of the other ones we've looked at. Net asset value is 2206, which suggests this one is almost perfectly in its fair value uh, trading range. So with that, let's see how we're doing. Um, yeah, we got four of you on. We got one of you commenting. So yeah, I think there's a lot of people's old favorite, including mine. Well, I've had like three or four old favorites now. I've had QYLD. I went through a QYLD phase. Uh, then I went through a JEPQ phase. Oh, I just lost two of you. Uh, and then I went through a, what was the other one? I guess JEPI, um, Goff. SVOL. Then I started discovering the yield max funds like the um, OARK and TSLY and now APLY. Thanks to those of you in the audience that pointed those out to me, I've learned about more of these ETFs than I ever knew existed. You're watching all these TV. Deal. You know what's nice about all these. Well, all day. You know what's nice. Nice. Uh, I see what you're doing. It's really kind of annoying here. All of a sudden, we get noisy ads from Yahoo. But anyway, if anybody has any other questions, comments, or concerns, 
feel free to point them out in the comment section. Just wanted to do a video. Oh, you know what I want to do um, on this video? I'm going to look up kind of a list of all the crazy things that Jim Cramer has said. Just, you know, like a high level list here. I want to uh, point that out here. Oh, who showed up here? Someone named Neil, new fan. Always welcome new fans of the group here. So Neil says, I'm thinking of selling QYLD because I'm down and I don't see it recovering much for quite a while. I've actually thought about selling my QYLD, uh, Neil. So, you know, that's something I've thought about. Um, I haven't even looked at it, but I think we're down. And I actually, uh, I sold some JEPI and JEQ to buy TSLI. I lost a few thousand in it uh, this past week. Well, a lot of us, all of us that are in TSLY <laughs> lost because the earnings went down. But anyway, let me just uh, look up QYLD here real quick. Um, for the year, we're actually up for the year in QYLD. I'm surprised I haven't gotten anyone that follows my videos more recently that bought like January 4th and said, wow, you're a genius, QYLD is up 10%. The dividend's still holding at 12.12, but yeah, we are up. 10% in QYLD for the year. But since I bought it a year ago, we're down like three bucks. So you know what? It's only three bucks and the dividend I think makes up for it. So I may just hold on to mine. Um, and let's see, Neil here says I bought TSLY. I'm trying to think. I'm trying, I'm trying to see if you're actually someone I know, but anyway, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, a lot of us bought TSLY recently. Um, Benny Keaton here is eagerly waiting for the NVIDIA fund. Yes, yeah, so am I. I can't wait to see. And then Neil says again, I bought it last year. Uh, yeah, so did I. Sad face for me too because I'm down in it too. But I'll have to do the math and see how my dividends have uh, offset whatever it's dropped down to. But um, yeah, uh, once I once I figure that out, I'll make a judgment call on staying in or not. I'll, I'm due for another QYLD video. I haven't talked about it in a while. I usually beat that one up at least once a quarter. I was doing videos. I was doing a monthly dividend update because for a while, like I said, I went through that QYLD phase. So I was like, oh, 12% dividend. Let me cover that one. And I think it was actually higher at one point. But, uh, and then let's see, mine haven't even offset. Yeah, I've got to look at mine. I may be in the same boat as you. Uh, but yeah, I'll have to look and do the calculation on it. So now let me see here. Uh, let me look at well, you know what? I guess I can pull up QYLD on here. Why not? QYLD. So I'm getting more of you on now. Usually, once I start the live stream, I don't announce the live stream like in advance. So I think you all ha have to kind of find me <laughs> online. So that's why it takes takes like 20 minutes to actually get a live audience going. But once we do get it going, it's really, you know, two thumbs up. So, okay, QYLD 1212, because um, I was looking on the phone here. Yeah, going back to last April, uh, 1990. Uh, and then the low point was 1539, then 1591 for a second low point, and it has been coming back. Let's look over five years. Yeah, over five years, you're probably really in the tank, really regretting if you bought it. But um, for historical data, I think the dividends have held pretty steady uh, every, every month. Let's see here. Um, yeah, we've been since last May. We fluctuated around. It was eighteen cents, then sixteen point five cents, and then we actually went back up in January. And this could be because the fund has started to go back up. So I'll probably just. I didn't get that much of it, so I'll probably just stay in it for now. And uh, yeah, that's that. Once I add up. I used to really spend a lot of time on this stuff and sit there behind my spreadsheets and say, oh, I did this, I did that. But I've kind of let it go recently. Life's just kind of uh, taken a bit of a, a turn for me, I guess. Um, okay, up to six of you now. So let's bring some more comments in. Okay, uh, now let me... Okay, so we covered QYLD, SVOL. Let me do this here. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. And I'm going to look up... Going back to Mr. Kramer here. Let's see. Dumb things Jim Kramer has said. Those of you that want to beat me to the punch, type them in the comments. 
dumb thing Tim Kramer has said. Uh, let's see here. I want to try to find a list here. I know it's hard to narrow it down to a list. Oh, here's something from Seeking Alpha. The inverse Kramer strategy. Let's pull, let me, let me share this one with the audience here. Oh, come on. No, you can't be a Kramer fan. If you're a Kramer fan, then tell me what's, what's your favorite stock recommendation he's made. I mean, you can, you can like him as an entertainer. He's a good entertainer, but as far as like a serious stock picker, I think he's definitely not, or he's lost his mojo. Cause if you look up his profile, I think he went to an Ivy league school and he actually used to be on the New York stock exchange. So to get to that point, he had to know what he was doing at one point. Oh, Apple. Yeah, but anybody can pick Apple. I mean, a monkey can throw a, a dart at a dartboard and land on Apple. That's a little joke. But I, I think anybody that doesn't even follow stocks that close would say, oh, yeah, Apple's a good company to buy. Remember Forrest Gump, if you've seen that movie, even Forrest Gump said that uh, he got into some fruit company, which happened to be Apple. All right, we have a Jose Guzman sighting. Doing good. Uh, just getting a video out here. I'm trying to, for the next 10 days, turn a video out every day to hopefully hit those watch hours. Um, oh, does he say don't sell, hold? Well, that's a good thing he figured that out. I think, you know, most investors think that to some degree. But you know what? If you're a Kramer fan, uh, good for you. You know, that's that's really good for you. But uh, let's see here. Let me pull up the Seeking Alpha article. So we'll go here. And uh, I'm glad I get a lot of you regulars that show up here. That's good. I have a loyal audience now. So, so far, for those of you that joined a little late, we covered uh, the inverse Kramer funds. Then we found some political funds. There's like a Democrat and a Republican members of Congress fund that mimics, tries to mimic what the members of Congress do, which I think is a genius strategy. I didn't even know it existed. None of you all pointed it out to me. So I just happened to stumble upon it. Um, and then we looked at SVOL, then we looked at QYLD, and I've kind of just been going along with the um, what the audience is throwing out. So, all right, the inverse Jim Cramer strategy. So for those of you Jim Cramer fans on here, get your handkerchiefs out, get your tissues out, because this could be a little rough. We'll see. There is a clear and distinct trend throughout the history of stock investing slowly moving away from the professional money managers into the hands of the everyday man. Long before the rise and popularization of social media, it was finance and investment television shows that played a monumental part in the popularization of investing. In today's article, we analyze the performance of a host whose name has become almost synonymous with finance television throughout the years and bring to you our new trading strategy. By leveraging the collected data, we present to you our report on one of the investing world's greatest legends, the CNBC's mad money host himself, Jim Cramer. We have built a trading strategy that's by design inversing most of Kramer's top mentioned stock recommendations, which so far has proved successful in generating alpha on the market. So interesting. So far, it's proved successful, according to this. Um, and this was before the fund existed, so to speak. Throughout history, by a combination of technological innovations that created the necessary infrastructure and the advancements in terms of the average level of financial education, there has been a very clear and distinct trend of stock market investing slowly moving away from the professionals and becoming more mainstream adopted, henceforth a trade that is practiced by the everyday man. Oh, I'm exceeding my reading quota for the day. I can't keep going. I'm just kidding. It's good to read more, though, every day. Just not enough hours in the day. Early on, years before the birth and popularization of social media, it was the major media conglomerates that capitalized on this process by launching multiple finance and investing-related television shows that were almost predominantly oriented in both style and substance to the retail investor, one of the pioneers in the space was CNBC, and there is one name that's become almost synonymous with finance television, Jim Cramer. Yeah, I agree with all that. I just know he's been wrong on a lot of stuff. He's cost me money, too. I actually signed up for his service, um, and I didn't cancel within the free seven days, so I got popped like 200 bucks. And I saw his, it was called the CRT portfolio, Charitable Remainder Trust portfolio. And I was outperforming it at the time, so... Now, let's see what we got here. The Jim Cramer Report. While many look upon finance TV shows today as not much more than cheesy entertainment, there's no question shows themselves still have a loyal following and are still highest rated programming on cable TV. Now, I have to be honest, you know, when I'm working, when I'm at home working during the day, 
I'll turn on like Fox Business or something like that because if I'm going to watch something that's just going to kind of halfway be running in the background, I would rather watch business news instead of the other crap, you know, political news and stuff because there's nothing we can do about a lot of it anyway. So I'd rather watch something that can at least maybe make me money. But what I will say is all these talking heads in the media, by the time they catch on to something, they're behind the curve. In fact, I would go, I would go as far as to say that YouTubers are a little more ahead of the curve than these people on TV. So, and, and that's the thing, like social media is starting to supplant cable news. So let's see here. We got some more comments from Neil here. Jim Cramer's number one fan, at least on this live stream. He says, but you have those short-sighted investors who sell. That's true. He actually says, don't trade it, own it. Well, that's good. He's got some nice catchphrases. Maybe uh, print them and put them on your wall. Or he should, he's got some of them, I'm sure, on his on his show. He, he is funny. He is kind of like an entertainer, I'll agree. Um, yeah, thanks for the encouragement, Jose. Um, yeah, I'll hit him soon enough. The only question is, uh, if it goes a little bit into the next month, I'm trying not to like demonetize. I mean, I'll re-monetize immediately because I'm definitely on pace now. My average per month, I'm averaging like 700 per month. So I'm averaging, I'm, I'm averaging to like double the hours I was hitting before. So like, I, cause 700 times 12, that's like almost, yeah, it's 80, but that's more than double what I need, 8,400. Um, but what hurt me when I changed jobs in October and November, I was hardly posting at all. So like those two months, I had like 98 watch hours for those two months. So that gap is kind of what hurt me. And when I monetized a year ago, it was on a couple of viral videos, but it didn't sustain because I didn't have the consistent audience at the time like I do now, thanks to all of you fine folks on here. Uh, didn't truly find my niche till I started talking dividends, honestly, which happened almost a year after monetizing. So that's that's how that happened. So the average at first wasn't where it needed to be to stay monetized, but it's really grown over the last uh, three to six months, especially really the last three months. So yeah. And uh, yeah, it looks like you're agreeing with a lot. And then uh, Jim Cramer's number one fan, Neil, says he's been right with a lot also. Why don't you put your, you should make your name Jim Cramer's number one fan. <laughs> that would be funny. I'm not saying you're his number one fan, but you should make that your name, at least to make it entertaining. Um, but, you know, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you're a fan of his. You know who I like uh, on Fox Business? I, I like Charles Payne. Uh, sometimes he's behind the curve, too, but I think he's the best one on that network. And uh, he means well, you know, so I'll give him that. Jose says, do you trade options? Uh, I presume you're not asking me that. I've talked a lot of options on here. Um, yeah, so I do, but I don't know if you're asking someone else. Um, I've done options videos on here, but they don't rank as well as the dividend videos. <laughs> you said I'm not his number one fan. Number two, maybe. Okay, so put your name number two fan. I wonder who, who number one is then. But hey, you know, he's got to get ratings to have a show, right? So let's see, we were up to eight live viewers. We went down. We're not going to replicate the success of last Saturday, which last Saturday was amazing. Got my first super chat. And, um, but yeah, that was, you know, I didn't expect that to be an every week thing. And yeah, you were laughing at that there. That's good. Um, ooh, the lightning are winning. That's good. Three to two at the end of two. Let's see, let me refresh here. Uh, okay, what else can we talk about here? What else does, uh, oh, we jumped up to seven. Anybody else want to uh, throw out any other funds or any questions or concerns? Jose mentioned something about trading options. Uh, you want to talk options now? What like what what options do you want to discuss? I got into Danaher, but that one, something happened to it Thursday because I am I had like a $500 gain and I'm down like 800 bucks now. So I'm a little concerned in that one. But let's see. I'll give it another couple of seconds here if anybody else has anything. Otherwise, let me see if I covered everything in this article here. Inverse Jim Cramer. Oh, Mad Money Ratings Chart. Oh, here's his ratings of his show from December 31st, 2016 to May 31st, 2022. His ratings have actually gone up, but they started to fall. So during the, during the pandemic, they hit like new all-time highs because I presume all these retail traders that came into the market getting stimulus checks and whatnot. Then the ratings started to dip. They went up a, again a bit, and then they dipped again. I don't know how they're doing now. But yeah, no, he's getting ratings. I mean, there's no question to be on uh, cable news or cable TV. 
He's got to be getting ratings. Here's top programs from CNBC. And this article is old. This article goes back to like August of last year. S&P bear market history. Here's a pretty good chart here. Um, oh, this is how long the bear markets have lasted. Dot-com bubble, 929 days, almost three years. 517 days during the financial crisis. Only 33 days during the pandemic. That's the shortest bear market ever. And then this one, going back to when the, the timing of this article, um, 161 days since the peak. And that was because of uh, high inflation, Fed raising rates. So, wow, how about that? The dot-com bubble lasted longer than the Great Depression, even though the Great Depression was more uh, steep, obviously. World War II, so we had a bear market because of World War II, Vietnam War. I thought wars were good for the market. That's strange. Oil shock in the 70s. Oh, look at that. Does history repeat itself or what? 622 days because of high inflation and the Fed raising rates. Well, God, I hope, because uh, that was almost two years, but... You see the good thing after after that, the S and P was on a solid run upward, basically from the '80s all the way to the year 2000. So in this whole chart, that was like the best time to invest. With the second time being from 2010 to 2020, basically. So we'll get back to that hopefully. So Jim Cramer has lived through seven bear markets and has actively participated in the market in one way or another. So that's good. Um, let's see here. What is this here? Here is our list of Jim's top 10 most recommended stocks measuring perf the performance from the first to the last buy recommendation. Procter & Gamble, Walt Disney, Qualcomm. Oh, some of these aren't performing too well now. Constellation Brands, Morgan Stanley, Johnson & Johnson, Halliburton. That one's in the tank a little bit. Uh, Meta, <laughs> that's due for a comeback. Pioneer, Marvell. Well, that's this is outdated because, oh, wait, that's the uh, that's actually a good one. That's a 5G company. Um, I, I got it mixed up with the one that got absorbed by Disney, the comic, you know, the Marvel comics. No, Marvel with the two L's. That's actually a um, 5G company. So let's see. Inverse Kramer. The Inverse Kramer strategy. This is a good article. Return. <laughs> one year return. 20%. Kager, 26%. How about that? That's pretty uh, incredible there. Top shorts, final thoughts and conclusion. While often the target of criticism for a slightly lackluster stock picking performance, that's putting it nicely, the Mad Money host is without a doubt one of the most influential TV personalities. Hey, I didn't question influence, you know, but influence doesn't always translate to uh, results. But, you know, I guess if he gets more people investing, I guess net and net, that's a good thing. So, oh, let me see if I can just pull up. Stock picks by Jim Cramer. Five times Jim Cramer was wrong. This is a Benzinga article. Um, they got it narrowed down to five. Oh, here's a little background. Cramer graduated from Harvard with a law degree, but he did not practice law. Uh, maybe he should have stuck to law. Instead, in 1984, he got a job with Goldman Sachs Group. Shortly after 1987, left to start his own hedge fund called Cramer Live. Be partners. So, like I said, he did. He, he did uh, have a solid career in the investments field. Kramer Levy Partners for seven consecutive years. Kramer's firm beat the S and P. See, that's all impressive. Yet by the end of the 1990s, the money had gone mad, hmm, like the mad host. Huh? In August 1998, the firm lost 21 percent in just one month. For the year, it was down by 16 percent. In 2001, Kramer retired from the fund. Smart decision. And finally, in March 2005, Kramer recorded the inaugural episode of Mad Money. See, when it stops working for you in real life, just switch to TV, right? You see people in the sports world do this all the time, like coaches. Like they retire from coaching and then they just become commentators. And a lot of times that's a more lucrative career anyway. So since March 25 or March 2005, he's been hosting Mad Money. Very interesting. It's difficult to figure out exactly how many stocks Kramer has talked about through his journey as the host of Mad Money, but it's likely in the thousands. Like most financial pundits, Kramer has made wrong calls. We're going to look at a few of them here. Hewlett Packard, Netflix, Best Buy, Kohl's, and Corvo. So there's five there. So uh, we'll keep that just to that, I guess. Um, 
let's see. I went uh, quite a while here, but I'm gaining uh, more of you here. So you know what? Like I say, what's my rule of thumb? The more of you that show up, the longer I keep going. I'm almost 40 minutes in here. Let's see here. What did uh, Jose say? Do you trade Boil at all or any other leverage or commodity stocks? Oh, I've mentioned Upro. I trade Upro uh, quite often, and I do options on it too. But uh, Boil, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what this one is. Are the returns boiling on it? I hope so. Ooh, this one's bottomed out. This one's like an oil or natural gas fund, but you see the chart here since 2011 or so. It's like completely flatlined. But yeah, as far as leveraged ETFs, uh, yeah, I've traded that. Um, you know, that 2011 timeframe from what I can recall was a good time to be in. Uh, there was a lot of these like uh, Clearbridge energy funds and stuff like that that were doing really well. Um, there were those. But those have tanked too because oil has, you know, oil and fracking and all that have been way up and down. And so Neil says, uh, do you think we're going down to the October lows or worse? I certainly do. Well, I hope not. I mean, you know, we've got uh, genius government officials at the helm that should navigate us effortlessly through this. I'm just kidding. I tried to say that with as straight of a face as I could. But, um, you know, once we get Gavin Newsom in there, we should be really should be rolling. That's a joke too, uh, but I'm kind of uh, I'm afraid that's what's going to happen. Not to get political here, but um, the market. No, I I would like to disagree with this because here's the thing. Um, well, I guess going back into a little bit into politics, um, we do have an election coming up in next year, and um, I just doubt the market's going to be down in an election year. I just I have that feeling. Um, you'll see, the Fed will start to cut rates again. They'll start to make everything look good again. Uh, like they did in 2016, like they did in 2020. You see how quick that uh, bear market ended uh, in 2020. That was the shortest bear market we ever had. So around elections, the market just tends to uh, not crash, which is good for us as investors. You know, everybody that has a stake in the market, whether it be their 401k, their brokerage accounts or whatnot, you know, that's a good thing overall. I like to see. And yeah, I do agree with you on this. You definitely want to keep some dry powder. I need to be better at that. I've unfortunately ignited all of mine. I put the last of it into TSLY and, you know, of course, Tesla earnings didn't come in so great. A couple days later, had I just waited a couple days, uh, would have definitely made a better buy on that. But, you know, it's unpredictable what earnings are going to do. I guess I could have looked at the car prices and the one car dropped, like one of the members of the audience pointed out. And I could have seen that, uh, oh, you know, earnings might not be so good, but I just went ahead and got into it. So I'm officially, they've got me long term now. So, oh, Tim the Baptist showed up. APLY and TSLY being traded by European market style options to produce income and will not get assignment. How do you mean not get assignment? Is that what the synthetic uh, covered calls? Did anyone ever explain what the synthetic calls, synthetic strategy was? Because they the word synthetic makes it sound like some science experiment or something. I think it just means like covered calls, basically. So OARK as well. Yeah, that's an addendum to your last comment there. Jose said, loading up on boil and holding to at least 200% gain. Commodities should rocket thanks to inflation. Yeah, but why hasn't that happened already? I get where you're coming from, but why didn't that happen like a year ago? That's my concern there. Because right now, um, what I see, if you look at this chart, the returns on boil are getting boiled down to zero. So I don't know so much about that one there, Jose. Um, we're down to like 344. And dropping, I mean, this one, are you really looking at this chart here? I mean, <laughs> this isn't April Fool's Day. We're still in April, but it's not April Fool's Day now. Um, since January, we've lost from $15 to 344 So I don't know, unless there's something I'm missing. And the beta, and I never pay attention to the beta so much, but it's a measure of risk r r uh, relatively overall market. Um, five, a beta of five. I've never seen that before. If I'm just looking at the iPhone here, it's a beta of five. So. That's pretty concerning there. So let's see here. Uh, Neil has uh, really been commenting away here, which I like. Good for you. Uh, economic indicators are going to start reflecting Fed-induced weakness in the economy. Yeah, I know that's kind of the canned line that they tell you in the media, but I think uh, I think it already is. The job market's not really crashing, though. Oh, I see some newbie fans here that haven't paid attention to some of my last videos. 
I'm going to have to, uh, well, I'm glad I'm getting new fans, but just watch all of my videos. Cause I've talked about a lot of this. I'll get to those comments in a section in a, in a second, not a section. Uh, okay. Jose says energy is the cheapest right now compared to other sectors. Also buying BHP for uranium exposure. Yeah. You know, I've heard that uranium is going to take off. Let me look up BHP now. BHP group limited, uh, 9%. And I think, oh, I'm not following this one yet. I'll add it to the list. I probably got 500 on here now. Um, Boyle, though, I just I don't know about it. Unless there's something I'm missing. Feel free to add, you know, if there's something I'm missing in the analysis here. Just my own analysis here. Let's see, what's what's our score now? Oh, we're in the third period now, okay. Ooh, this game's almost over. The Lightning are going to win. All right. I wanted to go down there today, but tickets sold out for the watch party. Okay, uh, and then Neil said, same here with TSLY. Uh, especially in employment and the market is going to weaken, but eventually rebound as it always does. Oh, I agree. Just watch for next year. They're going to have everything looking great, you know, because they need to, the current folks in power, they need to have a great, uh, they need to appear like they have a great resume to run on. And they'll definitely concoct that one way or another. So, and then Kevin Perez says, what's your thoughts on the JEPI and JPQ? And Kevin, this is why I was saying, yeah, and many, many of my last videos, like this was like my main talking point probably four months ago. I was all in on JEPI and JEPQ. But since then, because the price is so high on those, uh, I've gotten into other ones and I've actually sold and I took like a 10% gain on like JEPQ. And I've sold and got into like TSLY and some of the other ones that are cheaper and SVOL too. So, but yeah, I've done many, many videos on these two. And then Tim the Baptist says, they are being traded on a European market. They will avoid assignment for an email I saw from them. Is that from Yieldmax? Or I'm not, I'm not sure on that one. You'll have to, you have to clarify here. Um, but that's good to hear in that case. So, yeah, I mean, if they'll avoid assignment... JEPQ is near its 52-week low. Is that true? i got to look at that now. And you're saying yes? Okay. Well, good to know. That uh, you know that makes me feel better investing in those funds. So far, I'm just in TSLY. I'm not in the APLY yet. All right. So we're going to go back to Yahoo Finance, and let's look here. I think that game went by quick. Just like this is going by quick. Time flies when you're having fun, right? Let's see which one. Oh, JEPQ. So you're saying it's at a 52 week low. I'd be surprised if I missed this. Come on, Yahoo. We're at 44.92, um, 44.98 in the after hours. At 52 week range, eh, you might be right. It's right in the middle. Not quite. It's, it's not closer to a 52-week low versus a 52-week high, but it's kind of like right in the middle. So let's see. 52-week high happened uh, August 8th, 49.78. You got to look at, see, this factors in intraday trading too. This chart's only factoring in like the closing prices, but the, the what it says over here, 52-week range, is factoring in uh, intraday trading too. Um, 40, 40, 40, and it's basically bottomed out at 40. So it's about in the middle. It's not quite at a 52-week low. It's about in the middle of where it's been. So let's see. Uh, what else do we want to talk about here? Uh, let's see. Well, it has gone up a bit in the last few weeks. Oh, well, let's look. Let's see. Uh, let me see. Because I, I want to say I got in at 40, which you're right. It was at a 52-week low. Okay, in December, it was at a 52-week low. And it was actually close to a 52-week low March 6th. So you are right. But it's a very fluid situation, and it's still a 14% dividend, so that's good. It was higher. Let's look, because I haven't covered JEPQ in a while. So many of these. I could probably churn out like five videos a day on these, just keep talking about all of these. One one day, I may do that. If I make enough money on here, I may do that one day. But it's got to be fun for me, meaning you all have to keep showing up and giving me good comments and stuff and making me laugh and whatnot. So let me see, because, yeah, like I said, I haven't covered this one in a while. But since December, the dividend's been holding it like – it's actually – it's a, th uh, a three-month high for the dividend, 45.4 cents. So, okay. 
at one point we got like a 68 cent dividend, which was phenomenal. And I did a video projecting basically if that were to project out for 12 months, uh, I had covered uh, that one. But let's see. So yeah, 13.52% year to date uh, total return since the start of the year. It's not show. Oh, I mistook that. That's not, I, I mistook that for yield. That's not the yield percentage. That's the year to date return. Let me just do this here because I think that's about, uh, I'll, I'll figure it out here. I'll figure it out here in a second. Hold on here. Oh, this, I keep refreshing ESPN, but this is faulty. We're still 15 minutes to go in the third period. I thought the game was almost over. Anyway, um, I knew that was fast. Okay, 45.4 times 12 is 544 divided by 44.92. We're down to 12%. We used to be at like 15% in that one. So the dividend is dropping, but still, relatively speaking, a good dividend, but the price is higher than other ones. So let's see here. And we got more uh, audience participation here. So Tim the Baptist says, if they drop below $5 a share, they will do a reverse split. Who? Who will do a re reverse split? Who would drop below $5 a share? Um, oh, you're throwing me for a curveball here. I'm going to have to look at JEPI now. All right. Well, I guess we're going to go for a full hour then. Jose says, Apple has more options volume than ARKK. Therefore, APLY should be higher than OARK. Well, interesting. I hope so. I'm going to probably, when I get a little more money saved up, I may get into APLY. So Neil threw me a curveball here. He says, I got mixed up. I meant JEPI. I'll look at that one in just a second. Will Compton, uh, Mr. Uh, I don't know, straight out of Compton here. Cool name. Synthetic Long is buying a call and selling a put at the money. Thank you for that clarification. So you're buying a call and selling a put at the money. That's what Synthetic Long is. Let me think about that. Because like I said, my option knowledge is still evolving. I started out probably at the caveman level, and I'm just now getting to like the missing link level in terms of options knowledge. So I'll get there one day. So you're buying a call and selling a put. So if you sell a put at the money, let me think about this. So buying a call is bullish. Selling a put, would that be slightly bearish? So you're going to collect a premium? So is that the strategy that this fund is using for the uh, for the yield max? Oh, I can take this one here. A reverse split. Um, I've been the victim of a few of these, and sometimes they suck. A reverse split. Just look at Office Depot, look at even uh, Twitter. Companies that are struggling with their stock, and even Citi did this back in 09, I think. So a reverse split, so you know what a stock split is. A reverse split is exactly a reverse stock split. So what happens when a company, say like Office Depot, they used to trade at $50 a share. Say they dropped all the way down to $5 a share. What the company does, they go and they basically take back shares. So say there was like so many millions of shares outstanding. Well, they cut the share volume in half and double the price. So to me, a reverse split, and I'm going to say this, it's legal theft is what it is. And your broker charges you a fee for it. I've been in like three of them. Office Depot was one that I know of. Well, I think actually Groupon did that too. And the funny thing, after the reverse split, it's down again, and it's probably just going to go bankrupt. So that'll be the second or third stock I've had that actually went completely bankrupt. I've had that happen to me like three times. That's how you know you're an experienced investor, right? Well, some fracking companies I was in, I should have got out of. Ooh, this looks good. Oh, I didn't get to it in time. Um, okay. So hopefully that answers your question there, uh, Kevin. Neil says, yield max funds look mouthwatering, though. I think I'll stay with TSLY and see what that dividend is like next month. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to definitely keep my stake in TSLY, and I'll keep doing videos on it. I'll update how it does every month. Um, but yeah, I also want to get into APLY. And I want to get into um, uh, NVDY when that one comes out. So, because I'm not going to buy any more Apple, because now the luxury that these ETFs have afforded us is that we can get into, uh, you know, these stocks for a lot cheaper. Because we just found Apple and Tesla yesterday. They're trading for the exact same dollar amount, which is hard to believe. It's really crazy. And uh, yeah, you're uh, you're welcome there, uh, Kevin. All right. Well, Jose, you hung out with us until you had to go back to work. So appreciate your attendance. Uh, have a good rest of your day at work. Thank you for attending. We'll see you on the next one. Uh, okay. Let's see. There was another comment. I was, oh, JEPI. I'll look this one up for Neil here since he's been my most frequent commenter today. Let's see here. Um, 
JEPI. I gotta ask you, Neil, did you just subscribe to me? Uh, Cause I haven't seen you on here before. I'm assuming I've got like three new people on here, which is good to see. Um, so I'm seeing the same thing with JEPI. It's about the, it's at the, about the midpoint of its 52 week range, but let's look here. Um, so it's higher than JEPQ and the dividend is about 11%. Uh, it was $52 March 6th. So that was close. And then if you look back to December, oh, this was September. We didn't have the dip in JEPI like we did in JEPQ. But yeah, you're right. It was close to the 52 week low March 6th. So with that, let's see, does anyone else want to uh, discuss anything else here? Gone almost an hour here. <laughs> So you did just sub. Well, thank you. Glad to have you as part of THB Nation. Uh, Kramer fans do comment a lot. I agree. The one that I've come across does. <laughs> you said that's crazy. Uh, and then Tim the Baptist said, and Berkshire Hathaway. That's another one too. You know what? I'll probably buy that one when that one comes out. I'm really excited about that one because it's really affording people um, really some good opportunities because like who would be able to get in, especially the A shares of Berkshire Hathaway? Uh, who would be able to get in for the price? It's like buying a house, but even the B shares and, you know, that's always historically been a solid company. So yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to getting into that one too. I got to save up some money for all of these uh, that are coming soon. And uh, let's see here, Neil. Yeah. Really glad to have you here. And uh, so, yeah, thank you all for your uh, participation today. Um, the Berkshire Hathaway fund. Does anyone know when that one might be coming out? I'm anxious for that one. Uh, I wish that we had a uh, timetable on some of these here. Kevin, you must be a new subscriber too, because um, I've talked about a lot of these actually. The QYLD is one of the global X. I've talked about, let's see, QYLD, RYLD, XYLD. In fact, one of my most popular videos from like a year ago, it's a thumbnail of me juggling like this. It's a real picture. I really can juggle. It's like a side hustle if you see it. You'll know it's real when you see it. <laughs> Just kidding a bit. Um, so yeah, Global X funds. Me neither. What were you responding to? I just I probably just said something and you kind of agreed. Uh, okay. Yeah, Global X funds. So yeah, I've talked about HYLD. Uh, is that one? QYLD, RYLD, XYLD. Seems like there's a lot of them. I went through a QYLD phase a year ago. And I still have it. I haven't sold out of it. And let's see here. Ooh, that's a good one. Domino's Pizza. I'll never forget how I bought Domino's Pizza at $15 on Kramer's recommendation, went down to 13 and I sold. Did he recommend that one? Wow. You know, that was a good one. You know how high Domino's got up to? I'll pull that one up. That one was a very lucrative stock. And around 2011, it was a great buying point. Let's see. I heard one may come out in another two months. I, get, I presume that's maybe Berkshire or maybe well, NVDY, I think is due maybe in the next month. But I'm telling you what, this yield max fund family, they're going to really take off because you can get into a lot of these stocks for really, really cheap. Don't say, I don't know, Neil, you might change my opinion on Kramer before the video is over. You kind of already have with the Domino's thing. But I don't know, does it outweigh some of the bad ones he's recommended? What makes me mad with him, like I said, the service that I signed up for and I got charged for it, 200 bucks. And it was just to see one of his portfolios that was up like maybe 5% or something. So uh, <laughs> we got a new, I'm going to look up Domino's now. Domino's was one, uh, I think in accounting class, I was looking it up for a, a group project or something. And I was like, dang, I wish I would have bought that. Hindsight's always 2020, but I was like, dang, I wish I would have bought that one in 2011. Of course, I didn't have money back then. Too young. Uh, Domino's Pizza. Yeah, a lot of that, like 2011, we were still coming off of the you know financial crash. We're still at 330, but we got all the way to like $426. And like you said, Neil, it was like $15 a share. So imagine holding on to that one. That was really good. And it pays a dividend now too. So let's see if we go to maximum, I think it was, um, yeah, it was up to like 524. When did it go public? It went public in 04. But see, you wouldn't have known. You would have seen here and you would have said, oh, it went to 32, then it dropped and it dropped. Who would have known Domino's would have like rebranded and gone on this crazy run? Same thing happened with Netflix and a lot of these. I mean, that was, you're talking about generational wealth that you would have made there. And even, it's even still, you know, and who knows if it'll get back to its 2021 highs, but even still, I mean, $330. I mean, you've really done phenomenally with that. If you got in. 
So with that being said, let's see here. I think we've kicked this one around pretty good this evening. Um, why do you say you're killing me? Is that because uh, torturing you with this Domino's price? Well, hey, I tortured myself with it for a while because the, the way that I learn, one day I'm going to hit these just right as I hit a perfect hour here. Uh, I'm going to hit these. I'm going to hit one of these out of the park and I'll be just like one of these popular channels on here that made all their money in Tesla or something. Yeah, I mean, I knock myself for some of these every day, but who knew? I mean, if you could time travel, uh, like you would be, you, you'd pick all the right stocks and you'd come back and you'd have generational wealth by now. More money than you know what to do with. So, but anyway, so yeah, I mean, like I say, Domino's, you know, there will be the next Domino's one day. You could even look at Chipotle, you know, after that whole E. coli outbreak. Um like in 2016, the stock dropped all the way to like 275. It's like a $1,500 stock now, even a $1,700 $1, stock. So crap, just you know, sell everything out of uh, all your other stuff and buy that. And th there's so many of these examples that, in hindsight, it's like, wow, you know, look at that. Exactly. And you said good luck. Well, thank you, Neil. I uh, really appreciate your participation there. So, all right. Well, good session, everyone. We're over an hour. Uh, class has gone over an hour tonight. And uh, really good participation for Saturday. Didn't quite hit where we were uh, last Saturday, but you know what? Still pretty good. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, class dismissed for this evening. And hopefully we'll be back tomorrow with another one. Thank you all again. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And uh, we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks. Take care.